welcome everybody to our webinar. We're going to be focusing on the reggae, uh, reggae then and now, so covering some of the history and the evolution of the exemption, and then uh, going into some sort of, you know, talking about what we see coming forward in the future, both from a regulatory and compliance standpoint, as well as a marketing standpoint and everything in between. We have a group of heavy hitters on today's webinar. Uh, some of the biggest names in reggae have joined us today in Etan Butler, Sarah Hanks, and John Stid. I have a quick disclaimer for everybody uh, to read through. And so first up on the panel, we have Etan Butler, who is the chairman of Dalmore Group, a FINRA registered national broker dealer investment bank founded in 2005. Dalmore provides a full range of investment banking services and specializes in assisting companies that seek to raise investment capital from individual investors through the SEC's Regulation D, Regulation A plus and Regulation CF. Uh, Dalmore is among the most active broker dealers in the world of Regulation A plus offerings, having served as broker dealer on more than, I, well, way more than 100 offerings at this point, and, and I think pretty much all of the most successful ones. So he, he is a, a legend in the game. Um, and, you know, Mr. Butler, or A-10, is, is recognized as an innovative pioneer in the Regulation A industry and is an active participant in industry summits, panels, interviews, and publications. Uh, Sarah Hanks, co-founder and CEO of CrowdCheck, if you know about Regulation A+, plus, you also know about Sarah Hanks. I don't know how many you've worked on, Sarah, but it's got to be into the hundreds as well. It has been around since the very beginning. Um, but Sarah ha is an attorney with over 30 years of experience in the corporate and securities field. Sarah's prior position was general counsel of the bipartisan congressional oversight panel and the overseer of the troubled asset relief pro program, the TARP program. And while this is putting me to shame, I feel, uh, I feel a little embarrassed, but prior to that, Sarah spent many years as a partner of Clifford Chance, one of the world's largest law firms. And while at Clifford Chance, she advised on capital markets transactions and corporate matters for companies throughout the world and began her career in London at Norton Rose. Um, she also has served with the Securities and Exchange Commission as the chief of office of, chief of the Office of International Corporate Finance um, and led the team drafting regulations that put into place a new generation of rules governing the capital raising process. And John Stid, uh, one of, I don't have quite as long an, a bio for you, John, I, I'm sorry, uh, but also one of the biggest names in reggae. Uh, as the director of strategy at an LA-based digital marketing agency, John helped bring helped brands launch and scale growth via digital advertising. Since then, John has leveraged that industry experience to build rich growth into the leading edge agency in the equity crowdfunding industry with over 200 million raised for clients and has worked on some of the biggest named and most successful reggae's and, and really is probably the first person I go to on any questions related to to marketing and uh, investor acquisition for reggae's so very excited for today's panel um, but you know Today is about reggae then and now. Um, I'll turn it over, I think, first to Sarah. And, you know, you've been around since the very beginning. Can you give us a bit of history and, and take us through the development of reggae um, into, uh, into, um, into today? Okay. Um, I will say I'm not quite that old because reggae has been around since 1938. Oh. <laughs> um, and it's, it's changed a lot in the meantime. Um, for, for many years, um, reggae was just uh, a way for very small offerings to be made. Originally, the, uh, the limit was a million dollars. Then it was put up to $5 million. And then it was um, used by um, very early stage companies that didn't want to go through the, uh, the SEC registration process. But the thing about reggae in its former uh, incarnation prior to um, 2015 is that um, if you were using it, you had to go through the SEC review process and every state in which you were offering. Uh, and one of the big differences from pre-2015 Reg A and now is at least uh, at least with respect to uh, tier two 
uh, offerings, there is no state review. Um, now the states you know, may not agree with that, but that's one of the reasons that made reggae uh, the engine that it is today. Um, in the very early days, I mean, it was it was used by early stage, um, you know, op operating companies. It could be used for real estate, and frequently was. Um, leading up to uh, the changes in 2015, it was being used by like one company a month. That was it. Um, and it was very much a, a complete backwater in the whole securities um, uh, area. Um, then um, as part of the JOBS Act, uh, people started looking at reggae and thinking, well, maybe we can use this as a sort of registration light provision. Um, and maybe we could make this um, something that, uh, that companies could use. And that gave rise to you know, uh, Title IV of the Jobs Act. Um, the, the really interesting thing in uh, the, the evolution of reggae is that when, when many of us, and this includes me, I mean, we looked at reggae and went, you know, it's not really crowdfunding, is it? Um, but because uh, the changes to reggae were adopted in 2015 and the, the um, regulation crowdfunding, Reg CF, wasn't adopted till uh, 2016, everybody looked at it and said, you know what, actually maybe we can use this. We can use this for online capital formation. Uh, and they started to. Uh, and the advantages of uh, reggae include much more um, lenient rules with respect to how and when and how, how you market, which I'm sure we're going to be talking about in depth today. But compared to um, a registered offering, the regulatory lift, you know, the amount of disclosure you have to make and the way you make it through the SEC, much easier. The rules about being able to use the internet are um, much, much more lenient than uh, exist for, for registered offerings. And everybody uh, started to look at reggae as like, well, this is a form of crowdfunding. It doesn't have to be. I mean, you could do an entire reggae offering offline with um, physical um, prospectus type offering circulars. That's not what it's being used for. It is truly, uh, truly crowdfunding. And then uh, Eitan's going to uh, take over with respect to, okay, so what happened after 2015 and how it's evolved in, in the last few years? Thanks, Sarah. So, so prior to 2015, um, or just leading up to it, reggae issuers could raise up to $5 million a year. From 2012 to 2014, only 26 offerings were qualified by the SEC. 2015, the SEC, SEC adopted the final rule implementing Section 401 of the Jobs Act by expanding reggae into two tiers, tier one up to 20, tier two up to 50 million in a 12 month period. Um, around that time, we saw the rise of what we call marketplace platforms like Start Engine, Republic, and a number of others that have since grown since that time. 2016, 175 million raised from reggae. 2017, 360. 2018, the SEC further amended issuer eligibility and related provisions. Uh, and during 2018, over 600 million was raised. That's when we got interested. Uh, until that time, we were focused primarily on Reg D 506C, which allowed companies to advertise broadly and raise capital only from accredited investors. Um, and 2019, it went from 600 in 2018 to approximately a billion in 2019, and that's when we got active. Um, the Dalmore's model has been to untether the issuer from the constraints of a marketplace listing approach, uh, enabling them to host their offerings on their own domain so that they could be the sole beneficiary of their own marketing and promotional activities uh, at a fraction of the cost that you'll see on, on many consolidated platforms. Uh, in the early days, we frankly weren't paying much attention to reggae. Uh, just like pre-March 15th, 2021, we weren't particularly involved with Reg CF, uh, which is when it went from uh, maximum 1 million and 70 to $5 million. And that got our attention. And we've since deployed a similar model for our Reg CF issuers that we have developed for our Reg A issuers. And today, Reg A and Reg CF has become Dalmore's core business. The Dalmore way is designed to make the issuer the sole beneficiary of their own marketing, promotion, 
customers, fans, from family, friends, institutional investors. And we do this um, at a fraction of the cost, like I mentioned, of, of, of the marketplace platform, uh, which lists your offering amongst many uh, oftentimes competing offerings. And perhaps most importantly, um, this process gives the issuer total access, uh, and I know many folks on the panel will appreciate this, total access to critical information on analytics, page tagging, audience building, and other analytics, which are critical to a successful advertising campaign. And we accomplish this by embedding an invest now button on the issuer's own domain. Uh, so that was then, uh, and this is now. <laughs> this is when it gets exciting. I have my notes here, guys, sorry. No worries. Um, 2021, we are on track for over $2 billion. Uh, the FTC has increased reggae limits from 50 to 75 million, March 15th. Um, there's been an explosion of more sophisticated issuers. Companies have already raised the max 50 million and now the max 75 million so far. Companies have gone public after a successful reggae by increasing shareholders and capitalization to meet public market listing requirements. Companies are using reggae as a means to go public. Public companies are using reggae to increase shareholders and to offer unique investment structures to anyone over 18 on a credit card from their iPhone. Private fractional share issuers are emerging rapidly, offering bite-sized share increments in prized and sought after, sought after assets, historically only available to the, the super rich. Massive increase in the number of Reg CF portals we've seen, and, and, and at Dalmore we expect to see some consolidation there. Uh, VCs are no longer being worried about becoming extinct because of Reg A, but rather they're getting smarter themselves on investor acquisition strategies and launching their own portfolio companies through the Reg A process. Quite successfully, I may add. Shout out to Kevin Morris at Wavemaker. You also have the upcoming Going Public series that plans to feature and stream Reg A issuers on the path to NASDAQ. Uh, and we now have a rapidly expanding secondary marketplace for private securities. Uh, offering shareholders a path to liquidity and so much more. Um, and so anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, uh, but that's a, a bit of where we were and kind of where I believe where we are today. No, that's that's fantastic. And I mean, you've, you've touched on a wide range of things that I will, I will come back to um, throughout this, you know, data and technology. Um, you know, I want to talk a lot more about, you know, the, the thing that makes this really really, really work, which is, you know, retail investors and being able to, you know, bring them into the fold. But I wanted to jump over just quickly to John and, and think about, you know, although you maybe didn't start into reggae uh, and equity crowdfunding as a whole uh, quite as early, um, you really have been around to see some of the pivotal pivotal growth in, in marketing and, you know, how we, how investor acquisition is managed. Do you want to give like a bit of a background of sort of where we've come from, from a marketing perspective on reggae and investor acquisition and take us into sort of where we are today? Yeah, certainly. And I, I think this, the setup there is perfect from Sarah's historical representation of it. And Ethan talking about some of those, those numbers, right? Because we got our start as a direct consumer agency four years ago. And I can say that in the last six months, We've launched more campaigns uh, in that six months than we had in the you know, total in the three and a half years before that previously. So the sophistication, uh, the, you know, the tools that are out there for people, uh, whether those are independent platforms or plugins that people are using to, to run their own campaigns and benefit from that you know, off the, some of the more traditional marketplaces. Yeah, there's there's been an influx, right? And talking about the changing rules in the space where you can you can raise more through a CF now. So um, from our perspective, we got our start into this already thinking about sort of digital touch points for people. You know, we were a direct to consumer e-commerce agency you know, helping people sell wallets, right? So you know, we were already thinking about the digital touch points for that. Um, you know, where not everybody's going to buy a wallet in one fell swoop. But, you know, when you start talking about people investing online, that's when uh, you really have to think more keenly about those touch points and how you nurture an investor through that. So that was something that we came in with from the start. And then with the influx of, of companies doing this, you know, you really have to set yourself apart, right? So 
not just more touch points, but more um, more detailed touch points, you know, whether those are uh, investor webinars or investing in content up front. So how do you, uh, this may make Sarah's ears perk up, so I won't call it, you know, uh, brand storytelling, but let's call it positioning, right? So how do you differentiate yourself from, you know, the number of companies that are also using the same platforms that anybody can use, right? You know, Facebook makes a lot of money because it's easy to make Facebook ads, right? But how do you make good ones? And, you know, I may be a little bit jaded because the, the algorithmic overlords have deemed me, you know, servable for all uh, uh, equity crowdfunding campaigns, but I see, you know, a lot of invest in the future of X, right? And it's, you know, uh, invest in the future of uh, the iPhone charter, right? Some of it's not very novel, but how do you position yourself uh, out ahead of that pack and, and tell your brand and position yourself well and do that through rich content, whether those are videos and investing in, you know, uh, a top tier way to display yourself, like with what we help build out for people through websites and, and email nurturing and, and video content and that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, that's where we're seeing the space going where, you know, more and more competition got to, got to separate yourself from the pack. Awesome. And, you know, I think that, you know, one of the things that we're noticing is really, I guess, it, it has gone from the days of, you know, you could put up a landing page and, you know, a couple of Facebook ads and, you know, your investor acquisition strategy was largely covered. I mean, with the exception of figuring out the storytelling to, you know, very much, much more focused on data science. Like, I'd love to see, I'd love to hear a little bit about where you think that's going in terms of just data science and the science of investor acquisition. And then A10, you know, one of the things you mentioned was tagging and tracking and analytics. And I know you're passionate about it. Would love to hear your thoughts afterwards. Sure. So yeah, you know, the importance for data for us is, is paramount, right? Because we need to know what channels drive people in and then how they convert. When I talk about those touch points, right? Nobody buys a wallet in one fell swoop. You know, nobody's gonna invest $1,500 in one fell swoop. So what are the most effective channels for us to drive that traffic in? And then how do we convert them? Is it email X versus email Y, right? So our ability to do that is crucial in how we allocate budget, right? Because we can see that we can more effectively bring people in through X channel and then they convert when they hear about Y, right? That's very important to us. And to the extent that DealMaker ties into that, you know, the technology, that allows us to see where somebody came in throughout that process um, is crucial to how we allocate budget and test new channels, right? Because when we're trying to separate ourselves from other campaigns that are out there, right? We're, you know, we're not just looking at, you know, Facebook and Instagram ads. It's, you know, different threads of the Google atmosphere, right? Because they have video and display and search, right? But there are also content partnerships. Uh, that you can do as well. So, you know, our ability to scale channels, but also test them relies solely on the ability to track them. So if you can't, you know, you're, you're really shooting blind. Um, and then it gets down to, you know, the, uh, the ability to use that data um, for, you know, like CRM, right? Where you're, you're helping to nurture those investors. A lot of times, you know, people aren't going to the crowd just once. You need to be able to communicate to them on your next raise, right? So, you know, the importance of owning that data, uh, um, treating it well, right? That's not a very scientific term for data management, but, you know, how do you, how do you uh, segregate those different folks uh, so that you can speak to them specifically when it's, you know, time for your next phase, um, you know, all of which is uh, significantly aided by the, the tech of DealMaker, which we appreciate. Awesome. Hey, Tan, anything, anything to add on the, the data science and data perspective? Yeah, I would say that, you know, a broker dealer's role in this picture is really, you know, there's performing diligence on the companies and investors, there's overseeing compliance, of course, there's, there's also assisting with capital raising efforts, but we look at it as a, as a bit more and it's evolving. Um, over the years, we've, we've seen, we've observed what has been working well and not so well for a, a number of our issuers, the successful ones and the ones that are still trying to become successful. And we we we're really obsessed about accumulating more knowledge in this space because that makes us more helpful to our issuer clients who we, who we share this information to. I would say that um, it's still early on. Remember, like Sarah said, reggae has been around since forever, but it, how it's manifested recently is really a relatively new phenomenon. Um, and 
So we've been involved really for the last two years or so, right? And you know, you have 12 months to raise the max amount that you're qualified for. So we're just now starting to see completed offerings and we're recognizing who are the marketing companies, what investor acquisition strategy did they use? How effective did they leverage their own ecosystem of investors and fans and subscribers? And we're really interested in that. Um, and, uh, and, and so, there, you know, get, again, we have some issuers who, who have figured out a way to become crystal clear on every dollar they invest in Facebook, they're going to yield X dollars in their offering. They have it somewhat down to a science. Uh, as do a number of investor acquisition and marketing companies. They're getting smarter, they're testing, they have more data. Um, and it's something I personally am fascinated in, right? You know, with, uh, you wanna make this process ideally as predictable as possible to the issuer, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, th there's, there's already enough stress in worrying about making money. You wanna make sure they have the right technology, they have the right team. I've seen people hire the wrong attorneys who kind of have, have led their 1A into the desert for many, many, many months. Um, yeah. I've seen people make the wrong decision on, on technology service providers um, or on broker dealers in some cases. Um, and the importance of working with, with, with a team that has done these before has been a member of successful offering after offering is, in my opinion, very beneficial. Um, and that certainly applies on the marketing side, on the investor acquisition side. Every company is different, of course. You know, you have uh, big consumer brands that may have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of loyal customers that they could use to convert into loyal shareholders. It's amazing the loyalty people feel when they are, have a shared interest in the upside, right? They become brand ambassadors. You have celebrities and influencers who are linking up with issuers uh, to leverage their own followers, right? Um, all that is great. All that's an advantage, you know, but certainly not every issuer has any of that. And they become very reliant on advice surrounding, how am I gonna get eyeballs to my offering page? I get it. It's set up. It's live, but I'm not on a marketplace platform, so I don't have the chance of all these hundreds of thousands of investors, you know, looking through and finding me. And so effective marketing and promotion is critical, as is distribution and syndication, which is very unique to Reg A so far. Uh, it's very much very unlike what, what, what we've seen traditional Reg D syndication, where you have a lead broker and you establish a, a syndicate network and everyone calls their institutions or family offices. People aren't calling people for a thousand dollar investment on a credit card. You kind of got to go where they are, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so we've worked with issuers to not, not only give them the opportunity to have their own page where they're the sole beneficiary of their own marketing and promotion, but also get them listed on some of those marketplace platforms in addition to that, but to pay, but to do it on a commission only basis. So again, any advantage you know that you could you could bring as far as you know consistency and exposure um, and data, uh, the better. Awesome. And so, and you mentioned something real, sorry, you mentioned something really important there, like everybody's looking for eyeballs. And I want to go over to Sarah because, um, and actually I have a couple follow on questions because we've got some great questions from the audience too, that I, I think Sarah's expertise will be brilliant on. But, you know, 2020 was such a pivotal year. We've, we've seen, you know, a number of things change. We've seen in particular with the rise of retail investors, the prevalence of things like TikTok. Um, and Instagram stories and reels as, you know, places that financial influencers go, um, Clubhouse, Reddit, obviously, in the news consistently um, when it comes to it. But the rules around that are, are kind of, uh, you know, I mean, they're, they're clear, but they're, they're, they can be not clear, and there are new platforms that are coming out every day. How do you advise, uh, you know, potential issuers and, and partners to, you know, approach those, and what can and can't you do? Well, I mean, the, the starting point is always going to be before you do it, tell your lawyers, tell your lawyers you're going to be on, you know, um, meet the Drapers, tell your lawyers if you're going to be on Clubhouse, tell your lawyers uh, if you're planning to do something uh, on, um, on Instagram stories, because, you know, there are different rules for all of these. And um, much as we would like we can't read our clients' minds and they, they might think, oh, well, this is you know, completely nothing to do with the Reg A offering. 
And it is. I mean, the SEC sees anything that conditions the market for your offering as being an offer. And once you've got an offer, you've got to comply with the rules for the offer, uh, which might mean that there are things that you can't say at particular times because the rules change, depending on whether you're pre-qualification or post-qualification. The rules change uh, depending on whether the communication is oral, which is clubhouse, providing it's not recorded and distributed, or written, which is clubhouse, if it is recorded and distributed by the issuer, but not by anybody else. Uh, and this is, you know, I, um, like I say, I, I spend a lot of time on the phone with the SEC every time there is a new means of communication. Uh, and uh, we spend a lot of time being directed to, well, oh, well, this is um, an interpretation we did in 1995 that applies to your situation or 2005. So we're, we're applying old rules to new means of communication. So it is incredibly important um, from issuers point of view or anybody else they are using. So uh, influencers, newsletters, I mean, every type of communication that exists is being used in Reg A. And one of the uh, challenges that we have is sometimes there are people who are completely unfamiliar uh, with uh, securities laws, you know, movie actors and sports figures are being used to promote these offerings, which is all fine, but we have to make sure that they don't violate the stock touting rules of section 17B. And so we have these bizarre conversations with the entourage of movie stars who think that we're making all of this stuff up. Um, but they just haven't come across these rules before. Um, so from, from the beginning, <clears throat> the, the, um, any form of communication that you're making with respect to your offering or your brand, make sure that your lawyers know what you're, uh, what you're planning to communicate in plenty of time to stop there being um, problems. Because you know, we do see um, people who think, well, you let us do it last week and why can't we do it now? And the answer is because you're qualified now and the rules change. So just communicate with your lawyers and all of these things. And we are just constantly um, playing catch up with respect to the people who make the communications and the channels of communications uh, in order to keep everybody uh, compliant. It's amusing, but it can, be, um, yeah, it, it can cause some headaches. It, it, it sure does. I mean, we see it. We see it all the time. But I guess that you know the the most appropriate response is is find a lawyer who really knows the landscape and who knows regulation A plus. And you know, Sarah, that is that is you to a T. But it is it is pivotal to this kind of stuff, right? And I, I wanted to jump in because we've got a bunch of questions from from the audience, and they're actually there, there's some there's one that's really important. Uh, they're all actually really good questions, but there's one that I do want to cover that we don't um, we we don't get into. It's the difference between tier one and tier two, yeah. you know. And that's I, I think from my standpoint, you know, talking to issuers all day and potential issuers, most people see tw just the difference is 20 million or in, and, you know, 75 million um, and then unaudited versus audited, but it's actually much more than that. Yeah, that, that's, that's a really, really important point because um, we, we frequently um, have people say, well, we think we want to do a tier one because we're only seeking 10 million uh, and we don't need audited financials. And the answer to that is you only need audited financials at the federal level. However, in tier one, you have to go through the securities regulatory authorities in every single state in which you are offering. And if you are offering online, that's all of them. Um, and you have to comply with their rules. Some of the states um, uh, exercise this um, method of, uh, of um, review called um, uh, uh, merit regulation and you know great example of merit regulation back in the 70s I think it was Massachusetts uh, looked at um, was it Apple um, and said no you're far too risky to uh, sell in Massachusetts um, and so they, they can be very very conservative frequently they will um, not let you sell in their state unless you are offering you know, preferreds, you get a board seat, um, there are independent directors, none of this is, got, is, is workable for a company that is so small it's only seeking $10 million. Uh, 
even the uh, the states that practice the, the um, full disclosure review, we're, we're not going to say this is a good investment or not, but we're going to require you to put additional information in, means that you're going to get, you know, here's uh, I'm going to one state saying you've got to add these six risk factors, this is other state that uh, wants you to add more disclosure. Um, just to give you an example, um, can't say which company it was, but in the very early days, we had a company that because it didn't want to do um, the ongoing reporting that is required by uh, tier two, they chose to do tier one. And we're like, really? Okay. Um, we filed, um, we went through the uh, uh, North American Securities Administrators Association's um, uh, I forget what they call it, there's a sort of coordinated review process. Um, and we got 100 general comments, and then we got additional comments um, around the 100, 200 mark um, from the various states. We valiantly went forth, we changed the offering, we added independent directors, we refiled, we got um, Florida, Texas, California all told us you are not going to succeed in our state, just give up and go away. Um, we withdrew the tier one, we refiled as a tier two, we got seven comments from the SEC and six weeks later we were raising funds. That's an example of the two tiers. We do not, at CrowdCheck, we do not do tier one. Uh, we gave it a go. We're not going to do it again. It's only really suitable if you're somebody with like actual resources, like you know, real estate selling in three states, maybe. Um, then I would um, recommend tier one, but we wouldn't do it. Um, yeah, it was a horror story. <laughs> and of yeah. course, since CrowdCheck does fixed fee, you can imagine the impact it had on us. And honestly, every single time that I've seen it, you know, somebody who wants to do a tier one, it almost you know three or four months later it's like we're just doing the audits we're gonna we're gonna switch to tier two because the the filing in each state is is so costly um it uh and so time consuming it just you know you, you may as well just do the audited financials yep yeah and yeah. And, and of course some of the states are going to require the audited financials anyway mm -hmm. And, and just like, I mean, maybe uh, just a bit of level setting, like I think the, there, there was a question from the crowd on, you know, differences between Reg A and Reg D. Um, you know, can Sarah, like, just sort of a quick overview on, on the differences there. Yeah, well, if, if you're selling to accredited investors only, um, and uh, that's what, you know, generally, they're generally advertised um, uh, flavor of Reg D under 506C that, that is accredited only. If you're selling to accredited only, there's no rules about what you have to disclose. There's no rules about financials. There's no rules about disclosure. You could literally do it on the back of an envelope if you wanted to take that risk. Um, but once you include any accredited, uh, any non-accredited investors, so if you used 506B, uh, you're allowed up to 35 non-accredited investors, and then you have to provide the same information you would under Reg A. Um, so it's uh, it's very free-flowing under 506B. I mean, the rules are basically sell to accredited investors only uh, and don't make any misleading statements. <laughs> That's basically it. Uh, whereas um, you, know, you want to reach the non-accredited, uh, there's a lot more rules. Awesome. Anything else anybody would, wants to add, or should we move to? Oh, uh, just uh, one final point in that, um, from a uh, efficiency perspective, and in which ties into an in investor acquisition um, uh, dynamic. Um, reg Reg uh, A uh, is a uh, the investor makes a self attestation as far as their accreditation or non accredited status. Uh, whereas uh, Reg D, the uh, the broker dealer has to evidence um, the fact that the investor is stating that they're accredited, and it adds another um, you know significant piece in the checkout process that needs to be accounted for. So, um, it, what Reg A brings to uh, the issuer for both uh, raising capital from accredited and non-accredited tends to be a a more seamless. Um, check out an investment process as a result of that self attestation. So that that is a important consideration as well. Excellent. And so you know we were we've we've talked about you know 
Etan, you mentioned that we are, you know, on track in 2021 for for two billion dollars raised um, under the reggae exemption. You know, I saw 2020 as a pivotal year where just so many things changed. Um, and I guess there's there's two trends. I mean, overall that I'm, I'm I'm witnessing. One is, you know, with increased success in the exemption, more issuers and more companies are looking at it as a, as a truly legitimate means to, to raise capital and, you know, raise capital on a consistent basis. Um, the second aspect of it is, you know, an increased sophistication in issuers overall. Like I, in our, we, our last webinar, we were talking about, you know, the rise of warrant portals and the use of warrants in reggae. And, you know, who would have thought three or four years ago that we, we would be talking about, you know, doing warrants for companies and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, how, how do you see those sort of two aspects playing with more issuers coming in and increased sophistication? Where, where is the market going? And what are the, what are the evolutions that you guys see um, coming coming to play over this year and, and next year? So I think it's important to remember that Reg A is really a tool that allows issuers to take a unique share class structure, equity or yield-based or debt um, to the masses, right? It's, it's, it's more about, it's tradition, it's historically been utilized and associated with crowdfunding, but it doesn't have to be. Um, for example, one of our shared clients raised, you know, I think $50 million in around three months of which over half came from institutional investors, right? So I think, you know, that's the direction I think it's going in. That's ultimately perhaps the healthiest uh, application of the regulation um, because if institutions or VCs are investing at a similar or the same valuation as the everyday investors, to me, that seems, it, it feels right, right? Um, and um, I, think, I think we're gonna, I, I think with that, uh, with the SEC signaling, granted three to two, uh, the increase to uh, to 75 million, um, I, I think it's gotten a lot of people's attention. I think that you know the rate that it's grown annually uh, since you know 2012, 13, 15 to 18 to 2021. Now, right through COVID, right, it didn't, it didn't slow down. If anything, I think it kind of picked up uh, because more people were home on their devices. Um, Look, we're in an environment right now where traditional banks are shutting down, bank challengers, fintech companies are replacing user experience. People are, you know, 70% of reggae investors are, uh, are investing on their iPhone with a credit card, right? And so um, that really opens up a, the opportunity for issuers to go direct to their own ecosystem of investors and also to others, and also to build audiences around what their typical investor profile looks like. Um, and if you get that right, you really could, could, could in a way, control the outcome of a, of a raise. You just have to be prepared properly for it and educated properly for it. Yeah. So one, one thing I, I could mention about the, um, I think, you know, one thing that has become obvious in 2020, and as Etan said, I mean, it was, um, you know, it really, it really didn't slow down. Um, we had this moment of panic in uh, March where we had a few clients go, oh, we're closing down. Um, and then we thought, well, maybe things are gonna be worse. We, we have never been as busy. I think part of the thing is, as, as Aitan says, people at home on their devices, we are seeing a whole new class of investors. I don't think they're the same guys as the Wall Street bets. They are not the meme stock guys because you can't make a fast profit. These things are mostly very illiquid. Uh, but I think a lot of the guys who are investing, we're seeing these sort of the Henry's high earning, not rich yet. Mm -hmm. Those people are uh, investing in early stage companies because they're, you know, they, they're seeing the opportunities here. Um, and 2020, I think, um, was a watershed year in the way that uh, reggae de um, develops, both in the case of the issuers, the investors, and the types of securities being offered. Um, and I think, Mike, to, to what you said on the, um, on the warrant issue, I mean, we hadn't seen warrants I'm no, probably not even once before last year. Last year, we, we started seeing them. Here's another area where you really do need to have good lawyers because of course, if you've got warrants, you need a warrant agent. And you also need to make sure that the uh, offering that includes warrants stays open long enough for the warrants to be mm -hmm. exercised. We are seeing failures in that area. <laughs> um, 
that's le learning for all of us. Yeah. What, one, yeah. Other, oh, no. one other really be beautiful thing has happened is, is that, you know, minority owned businesses that have historically had a really difficult time getting the attention of the stiff suits on Wall Street now could say, screw that. I'm going to take advantage of this regulation. I'm going to go direct to my community. Um, and we're seeing success there, which is incredible. So that's the true democratization that was the intention of the Jobs Act, from my perspective, that we're seeing that unfold right in front of us time and time again. Yeah, that's that's such a cool statement, Eitan, because, you know, one of the things is, you know, it, there there is, I guess we've seen it in many ways come full circle where, you know, you started to see a lot of companies who were maybe disintermediated from the institutional capital pool or the VC pool. They just weren't, you know, in the right industry or they weren't the right profile or, you know, they weren't in the right location and they weren't having any success, but these were good legitimate businesses with, you know, a following, a loyal customer base or just a great idea. And, you know, we've seen the growth of, of those companies be able to raise capital and, and eschew, you know, that world. And now we've seen the institutional world and the VC world come in and, and participate in these deals much more on this, as you mentioned, on the same terms. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I guess, you know, we with the, you know, Sarah was touching on it, like the, you know, the, it, it isn't necessarily the Wall Street bets crowd. Uh, John, that uh, that is investing in this, and yes, there aren't there aren't many opportunities in reggae uh, to make a quick buck. The, the but the we have seen a big growth in the investor base that is looking at these deals and is looking at them legitimately. Like John, how how have you seen the investor profile, you know, expand? What is the investor profile, and and sort of how have you seen, I guess, the growth of of the retail investor and investors as a whole, you know, not just retail, who are looking to invest in these deals. Yeah, certainly. I would say that the the demographic information that that we get, you know, certainly fits the profile of what Sarah was talking about, the the Henry folks, and you know, that's typically who we are targeting. I will say uh, uh, we do advertise on Reddit, um, so they're you know getting in front of that crowd. Uh, is is also important, um, but you know some of it is, um, you know the the digital shift that was accelerated by COVID. I think everybody spoke about the dynamics changing there, and we had the very unfortunate scenario of ending a campaign in March 24th. So you know, really like 10 days after the the news really dropped here, everybody very confused. The next month, we ended a company's campaign, Monogram Orthopedics, and you know we're setting daily records in terms of uh, dollars raised on the seed invest platform. And to see that come back uh, in step with the market in that way, you know, and we are you know tied to the markets to some extent, but I, I really do think this has been um, a, a, a step function change in sort of people's. Um, understanding of, you know, investing online. As Anna talked about it, it's, you know, people are investing online on their phone uh, with a credit card. And, you know, people speaking about the, uh, you know, COVID accelerants, right? It's, it's happened with this as well, where, you know, people are used to these digital experiences, learning about a company and investing in them that way. So, um, you know, it certainly aligns with the, the demographics as well as general consumer habits of, of what we're seeing, because we do see uh, a lot of the, the age and demographic breakdown. Um, so when like Sarah said that, you know, that one company couldn't do uh, Texas and California and New York, it's like, whoa, you know, we, we see, you know, the our impressions, right? Where our ads are served, you know, if you can't get into those states, uh, good luck. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, I think that, you know, the other, I, I don't know the exact pool or the exact number um, of, of potential investors who could take part in a reggae, but it's in, in the hundreds of millions, if not, you know, billions, if you include international investors. Um, but you know how how have you seen that grow? And like we've seen on the dealmaker platform, you know we have let's call it fifteen percent of the investors that invest are you know invest in mul more than one deal. Um, the rest are sort of like one offs. But how how do you see that growing over the course of the next year in terms of of the total pool of potential investors? You know, do you see that that expanding dramatically over the course of the next couple of years, John? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, some of the the tracking changes on uh, with the Facebook shift with 
around the iPhones with Apple, right, has, has made it harder to, to track some of those things. Um, but certainly do see an expansion there, you know, propelled by these uh, consumer shifts in, in digital behaviors, right, where people are, are more familiar with doing this or, you know, even propelled by what they hear <clears throat> about the stock market and, you know, not meme stocks aside, right, where people are understanding that you can, you know, leverage these tools to get access to companies, right, so where the retail investor can, you know, um, be a part of the upward trajectory of the company. And to Aton's point earlier, you know, um, how that really shifts for people where they are getting in on the same terms as these institutions uh, is really powerful. So I think as those habits change, and, you know, people are going to talk about it as, you know, I, if I invest in monogram orthopedics, this uh, knee and hip uh, 3D printed custom fitted joint replacements, right? How cool, you know? It's, so I think there will be a, a word of mouth effect to that, just like you would when, you know, you buy a t-shirt from your favorite brand, tell your friends about it. Well, you're certainly going to tell your friends about, you know, the, the $1,500 uh, that you invested uh, in, you know, XYZ company. So, um, yeah, I can see that continuing to take hold um, as that changes. And, you know, people are getting more and more ads around this, right? And I talk about my own digital experience, which, as we know, can be unique, right? I'm in some sort of uh, pool for uh, uh, reggae investments. Uh, so all the more reason to, to really be differentiated in your positioning where, um, you know, because you do run the risk of people getting desensitized to that. When you see the future of X, Y, Z, A, B, C, right? The 10 different future areas, like, well, you know, uh, enough of that. And, and then, you know, then the, the you know, the MISO Robotics comes by. And it's, you don't want to be desensitized to that because, you know, MISO Robotics is a campaign that we're running on DealMaker right now. It's tremendous is it, um, for, you know, them as uh, WaveMaker and the strategy that they're doing, but just MISO Robotics as a whole. And be ashamed that, you know, some, some app before it had sort of desensitized that that person to uh, the opportunity there. So all the more reason to have better positioning on that. But yeah, certainly a step function change in uh, you know the number of people uh, investing in these companies and the way that they're doing it. You know, being more familiar with digital checkout experience. Awesome. Um... Another question, I mean, actually a lot of questions, which is great. Uh, thank you to all of our attendees. I, I love it when you get a, 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 la a laundry list of questions from the crowd. Um, it's, it's an engaging conversation, but one is let's, let's talk just quickly on costs. Um, you know, what, what, you know, Sarah, A10, what do you, like all in, what does it cost to run a successful reggae? I think probably Sarah, the I'll easiest way the, is, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll let you take that one, Sarah. All right. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, you've got, you've got to, this, this is very much a, you know, how long is a piece of string? Um, <laughs> the, 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 the biggest variable um, I always see is with the marketing. And that is actually the most important component there. And so your, your most important thing is your most, you know, how, how much can you spend on uh, you know making sure that people are um, are aware of your offering, um, yeah. You know, le legal costs. We do fixed fees. A standard uh, operating company is sixty thousand. Um, we also have you know variable fees, uh, um, various other fees for REITs, um, for uh, ICOs. If you really have to do ICOs or something, yeah. You know, NFTs. Um, We've, we've got to do some extra work there. If you're doing a series offering, then there's, there's some extra costs there. Um, that's fixed. Um, auditors, I think, uh, is probably the next amount. If you're an early, very super early stage company, if you were just formed, you can do um, as of inception financials, but the, the uh, financial the, the costs are going to increase from there on. Um, uh, Edgarization, uh, you've got to you know, put in a few thousand for that uh, because that, you know, that is taking um, Word documents and then dumbing them down into HTML 5.0 or lower or 6.0. So you've got to, to account for that. Um, account for state filing notices. You know, we, we discussed the fact that the states don't get to um, review your offerings, um, although they do pay attention uh, 
And uh, if you if they think that you have improperly disclosed, for example, um, uh, regulatory issues in the past, Arkansas is paying really close attention to this. Uh, so you want to watch out for that. But the um, the states um, don't review disclosure at per se, but they do get to charge you for um, offering in their states. So at the very least, you're probably got like twelve to thirteen thousand in initial filing fees, and you're probably going to have to true up in the states where you where you sell a lot. We end up um, truing up in Texas. Uh, and Washington State for some reason a lot because they have variable fees. Uh, and if you have any kind of success, you've got to increase the amount that, that you file with them. Um, transfer agent, um, you do need a good transfer agent. You especially need somebody who is um, set up for multiples, many multiples of investors. Uh, and who can keep track, assuming that, you know, you might be a company who's coming from a Reg CF background, you've raised some under Reg CF, and now you're raising under Reg A, the transfer agents are going to have to keep track of those because there are the conditional exemptions from full registration with the SEC. You've got to know what exemption the offerings were made, uh, the, the securities were sold under, uh, and when they were made. So you need transfer agents to do that. Um, and then um, brokerage fees. Um, you know, are you going to go with a, an accommodating broker dealer, broker dealer of record, or are you going to go with a you know, full se selling um, broker dealer? Uh, so uh, account for you know, somewhere between 1% and 7% or 8% in that area. I think can get into more details. Uh, and then marketing. Uh, and John, I'm going to let you talk about because <laughs> we have seen everything from I don't need marketing. I have an Instagram following of a million people. Um, and in, in that case, it's just like, yeah, but that million people were all teenage girls and they cannot invest um, to, you know, yes, we're going to spend a, a vast fortune on uh, marketing. That's that is where, you know, that's where the dollar matters most because people don't sit around on a Saturday night with a glass of wine going, I've got $5,000 from my Aunt Ellie's will. I'm going to invest it. Um, you've got to get their attention. They're not looking for you. You've got to go looking for them. So I'll hand it over to Aitana John for you know, the, the, the marketing. Yeah. And I, I, would, I would just add, I would just add that um, not only should investors uh, be encouraged to review the Forum 1A for the company that they're considering investing in, which is, in my opinion, very important because that's really what contains, that's not the flashy marketing stuff. That's the facts that the yep. SEC is reviewing, asking questions on, and ultimately, hopefully qualifying. Um, uh, but the issuers should also be encouraged to explore other 1As because right in them are who's the attorney, who's the broker, how much should they pay, what's the structure, right? So you get a lot of information other than perhaps one of the more important what that Jonathan will talk about, which is marketing. That's, you, you'll see how much that in their source of funds they're, they're planning to use for marketing. Um, but as far as how, how, you know, what, they, what, they should be, what, they, what they should show up to the table with um, really depends on, again, the nature of the issuer, right? And it depends on um, whether or not they have a existing ecosystem of investors, fans, and followers to target, um, whether they have ex extensive PR. Um, and if they don't, then that, you know, that, that's going to increase the amount that they should budget um, because they're going to have to deploy a number of different marketing and acquisition strategies to see what is working. And the things that are working and converting well, they're going to want to pour the gas on. And the ones that aren't, they're going to want to reassess, step back, and tap the brakes on. Uh, and that's really what, what, what Jonathan is, you know, is known for, and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, Sarah, great pitch. It's too bad you're tied up over there. That was, that was pretty good. We want to get you on board over here at the Ridge. But, um, you know, it, we do see that, right? And so our costs up front, uh, it's typically in the, the 20K mark, right? As we're building out a website for somebody, all of the tracking, you know, how do we connect to DealMaker on the back end of that? There's a lot of code and how do you get that to talk to Google Analytics so you can track those folks? How do you send that over to your email service provider? designing all of those emails, right? Um, also helping you create the content, right? When I talk about positioning and differentiating yourself, 
from the other brands out there. You know, if you're raising over $5 million, you should probably have a well-edited video of some people from the executive team talking about the, the investment opportunity, right? So investing in brand and story upfront is, is paramount, right? From there, right, we're, we're pretty flexible. We do month to month. So, uh, you know, so if your, your raise ends or that Instagram account worked out where you are able to tap into your own audience, then, then great. I would love for you to have a, a four month raise versus a, a six month raise, right? Um, but part of our job is to, to help people identify those opportunities. You do own some audience, right? You come in with your own customer base and great. Let's figure out how to design an email drip and really nurture them uh, to help, you know, shorten the, the life cycle of your raise and make the overall cost lower. Because we're, you know, we're often on the phone with, you know, CEOs and the management team weekly, bi-monthly, right? Now there's, you know, external costs to um, running this crowdfunding cam equity crowdfunding campaign that, you know, aren't your core business operations too. So important to factor that in as well. Excellent. And then, you know, I think the, 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 the final side of it, and we'll, maybe we'll leave it on this. And, you know, I think that the, the role of technology is incredibly important in, um, in a successful reggae. You know, I think that, you know, when you're talking about bringing in hundreds, if not thousands, and potentially tens of thousands of investors into a funnel and being able to process them through, being ensuring that they're signing their documents correctly, that they are funding, that they are, that the AML is in, and background checks are being done correctly, that the broker dealer has a chance to sign off, and then all of the tracking is done, um, you know, effectively to feed back into the marketing. Like what, what do you, in terms of technology, how important is that overall? In, uh, in the operation of a reg A. John, maybe you can talk there and then Eitan and anyone else who wants to jump in. Sure, yeah, you know, that that data management, right, where we're looking at people as they come through the, the funnel, and that's why we love to, to plug into DealMaker, uh, because it does help us segment our audiences, right? When I talk about all the in-depth tracking involved, right, when you pass through from one of our website experiences to the DealMaker platform, you know, capturing that information and update in it, right? So picture it like an Excel sheet, right? Where you know that you are here along the process, which allows investor relations functions to help nurture that, right? And where are they in the investment checkout process, if you will? And what sort of content can we get in front of them based on that to help get them over that hurdle, right? Is it you know, an investor webinar? Is it you know, uh, you know, an interview with the company's customers, right? Something to that extent, uh, very important. And, you know, not just for this raise, I talked about companies doing multiple raises, right? How do you come back to that crowd and know where everybody sits in the stack, whether it's how much they invested or if they didn't last time, right? Uh, speaking to them specifically based on those different attributes, right? Uh, and that comes down to data. That's all I got. Any, any final thoughts, Etan or Sarah? I would just um, say... Yeah, go ahead, Sarah. I, I would just say, say what Jonathan just said about data. I mean, you know, one of the things that keeps coming up in uh, reggae is everybody wants to know how much was raised and you know who, who was the team and everything like that. There's no central place for that. Um, data on reggae is going to be a hugely profitable area for someone. Eitan? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, um, the broker dealer vantage point is unique here and kind of sitting in the center of a lot of this. Um, and our, our model has been to remain somewhat agnostic to service providers. So, you know, we, I think we work pretty well with everyone. Um, but this has also given us uh, unique experience as far as observing how these various platforms, marketing companies, law firms, and payment providers work. Um, and that's helpful to the first time reg a issuer um, we like to show you the options we like to talk about the pros and cons uh, and as many of you i think know you know we've been fortunate to serve as the bd on a number of successful and high investor volume reg a offerings that were listed on the and, and are listed on the dealmaker platform um, and again you know you want to look for uh, experience you want to try to make this path as predictable as possible uh, again there's going to be enough stress worrying about getting your campaign off the ground and marketing right, uh, that you kind of want everything else to work as, as seamless as possible. Um, and, and we're certainly
certainly blessed and grateful to be working with everyone on this panel and, and appreciative to Dealmaker and the whole team and, and Rebecca and crew. Um, and, you know, sometimes I talk with you guys more than my own family, um, <laughs> certainly through the pandemic here. Uh, and Sarah, I know I, you know, back and forth all the time. So, um, but that's, that's how I would end it. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I thank you to so much to A10, Sarah and John. It's a fantastic conversation. I have a laundry list of questions that I haven't gotten to. So we'll have to do a follow up at some point in the not too distant future. Um, just for everybody who's on, you know, we will send around a recording. If you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, Mike at Dealmaker and I can direct you anywhere else, but we'll send around a follow up email to uh, to everybody with contact and follow up information. And if we haven't gotten to your questions, we've recorded them and we will try to uh, get them out and get some responses over uh, as soon as we can. But thank you all. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their Thursday and, and a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks everybody, appreciate it. Thanks.